All right. So we have a lot of people joining us. If you guys want to put in the chat where you're coming in from, we're lucky to have Jeff and Paul from the Agile Pubcast. So you guys were showing each other your brews in. Is that what you – now, which one of you is likes the ciders? Is that – That's me. That's you. Now, I've, um, over this lockdown period, Tom, I've um, I've invested in a local cider company and they've sent me a box of mystery cider. Nice. So what I've been doing to kind of keep an element of, of joy to this, this lockdown period um, when me and Jeff record, uh, I pull a mystery cider out of the box, and I don't know what it's going to be. So I'm just going to I'm going to dig in now, and it could be a total surprise. It's usually something that's uh, let's, let's go with something different. There. So Paul, if it's something you don't like, do you still drink it, or do you? Oh yeah, I've got to drink it. Yeah, yeah I've got to drink it. Here we go. That is oh, it's it's a well-known one, Jeff. But that's Sheppies. Sheppies. It's very We've had Sheppies elderflower. 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 Huh. So that's that's a local cider for me. That's right down the down. That's Taunton. Yes. Lovely. I'm not. I'll, I'll be honest. I'm not a massive fan of elderflower, but I'll give it a go. <laughs> he normally normally prefers the pink fruits. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can imagine it will be sweet. So what do showing, you have, Jeff? Well, I was showing Paul Mike because this is my home brew. Ah. Uh, my working from home brew, which which I I um it finished finished fermentation about just 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 before we went or just after we went into lockdown sort of coincided yeah um i was asking paul whether he could see the difference because he's seen me have a couple of these pints now and it's it's, it's getting clearer i think isn't it's it? getting clearer and it's there's less of a head it's it's flatter it's fruitier it's changing because it's it's still got a little bit of yeast in there so it's, it's kind of living and it, every time you have the pint from the barrel it's slightly different so yeah my own my own little home brew so are you an experienced home brewer, Jeff? No, I, I, I did my first batch a while ago in uh, in a pubcast, for the pubcast, uh, just to, as a bit of an experiment, a bit of a set-based engineering approach. So I took yeah. the same, same base, the same malt base, um, but then had one batch which had certain types of hops and another batch which had a, another different type of hops uh, to see which one I preferred and then and in terms of you know learning and experimenting that sort of parallel experiments type thing yeah uh, and just uh yeah something something a little bit of a hobby so you're using your agile principles in your brewing that's that was the plan excellent <clears throat> excellent so this well, is it looks experiment like before yeah vasco says he's having a glass of white wine cheers vasco um, cheers everyone if you are having a drink cheers two people are having uh sauvignon blanc mm. So we have people from Aust Austria. Let's see. I know. Um, I know Tom Cagle is here from Cleveland. I saw. Yep. And we have somebody from Maine. Sharon from Minnesota. Paul and I went to Minnesota. How long ago was that? Two thousand six. That was my friend. It's a long time ago. What did you think of Minnesota, Jeff? I loved it, mate. I loved it. Um, it was cold, so, wasn't it? From memories, it was cold. <laughs> it was cold. Yeah. Um, I've got. Um, so funnily enough, so when we were there, I bought, so we went to see, we went to see the Timberwolves. Ah, yeah. And we Did, went to yeah. see the Vikings. Um, saw the Vikings yep. against the Packers, actually. Mm. Local derby. And I bought some kit for my, for my daughter. So I bought her a Vikings cheerleader outfit. She was two, at the, two or three at the time. And um, I bought her a Timberwolves tracksuit, uh, sweatsuit, what would you call it? Yeah. And then, um, my wife, because I've got a one-year-old now, my wife got the Minnesota Timberwolves tracksuit out of storage <laughs> the other day. Reuse it, hand it down. So she nice. my daughter probably only wore it like twice, maybe. Yeah. Uh, and so now he's got a he's got a Timberwolves tracksuit. Oh, that's crazy. My wife is um she has like organized every room in our house like three times since we've been kind of at home with this pandemic so i don't think she'd have anything from our kids when they were one so it would be probably at goodwill or something like that yeah. so all the stuff's come out of the loft old toys from 16 17 years ago clothes everything yeah so, so it's all these, throw these, anything away. It's these jobs <laughs> that we're all doing that we probably would never have done before but um emptying boxes that we would never have thought about emptying before yeah, yeah. you've got, got a little bit more time, haven't you, to look through yeah. old photo albums and I've noticed that on Facebook. A lot of people posting stuff that, you know, they've recovered from their loft or photos they thought they'd lost or 
you know, memories are being uh, posted on, which again is another benefit of this, uh, having this time to pull these things out. So I'm guessing most people know who you guys are, but just to kind of give people a level set, Jeff and Paul from the Agile Pubcast, just kind of tell us a little bit about your background. I'm, I think judging by the chat, most people know who you are, but you know there might be somebody out there that hasn't heard your pubcast. You want to go? Well, well, no, you, no, you start, and I'll fill in the fill in the gaps. All right. So, <laughs> so Paul and I have known known each other for and worked together for getting on for twenty years now. Um, we used to work at British Telecom together. Uh, used to pretty much sit next to each other, in fact. And so we were part of the Agile coaching team there. And um, although we've gone our sort of separate ways and doing our own thing, we, we tend to get together, you know, once a month, maybe a little bit more. Um, we run a couple of classes together or just catch up for a beer now and again. And we thought, well, if we're going to get together and we end up talking about Agile stuff anyway, quite a lot of the time, because that's both of our jobs. Um, maybe it would be interesting if we just stuck a dictaphone in front of us and recorded it and <laughs> a few people a few people started to listen to it a few more people started to listen to it and we found it was a great opportunity or excuse you might say to get together more frequently and and have a few more drinks so we're up, up to about episode number 85 now it's the they're, they're never scripted we never really we never turn up with a topic in mind um we just have a drink see what happens just freestyle don't we? just let it go and amazingly, yeah, people, like Jeff said, amazingly, people um, tune in. I don't know, yeah, I don't quite know why, but we kept, we keep <laughs> doing them because people keep keep listening to them, so. You guys are just very compelling. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I think it gets more, well, maybe less compelling the more I drink, but, but hey-ho. Yeah. So what are you thinking of the, uh, is it Edelflower? Elderflower. Again, it's very, as you can imagine, it's very sweet. Um, yeah. It's like it's like cordial, really. But um, mm -hmm. it's very, it feels very summery. And the weather here, I'm not sure what the weather's like with you, Tom, but at the moment, it's pretty pretty nice for, was it April? Late April, yeah. so we're expecting 20 degrees or so this week. So um, it's quite a nice drink. I've just been out for a run as well, so it's quite a nice thing to have when I get, came back in. It's quite refreshing. So, yeah, not it's going down quite well, rather. I was Excellent. on a work call earlier on, Tom, and um, somebody I was talking to said that today, sorry, they said today that this month, April, is the best April for a long time. Now, they meant weather-wise. Yeah. yeah. But my first instinct was, <laughs> I'm pretty sure a lot of people wouldn't call this the best April in a long time. <laughs> yeah. But in the UK, it has been a very good month weather-wise, which, yeah. which mm -hmm. has taken the edge off quite a lot. For, Especially for... with young kids, it makes, it makes childcare a whole lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. Let them get outside and wear off some of that energy. Exactly right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what we have a 15 year old boy and he's got a lot of energy. So he's got to go do stuff or he drives his mom nuts. So, <laughs> so, I, I so saw someone in the chat, Tom said, that, uh, I think it was Lisa saying it's not five o'clock in Richmond, Virginia, but it is yep. five o'clock somewhere as Jimmy Buffett once said. That's so, right. Uh, yeah. That's right. Back on. <laughs> so as you guys do that, you have the pubcast and you, you know, do work with other companies. How does that work? Do people give you a hard time for the, the pubcast or has that got you a lot of notoriety <laughs> and, and, and helps kind of open your brand or how does that work for you guys? Oh, I was, I was initially quite nervous about it. Wasn't I Jeff to be yeah. fair. And, um, cause I thought well, it was just going to be, it, we could be ridiculed, unprofessional, you know, kind of, yeah. um, but it's, it's come up in some really strange conversations now that and quite regularly um, I'll be teaching or I know that Jeff and I teach together and some will say, oh, we love the podcast, uh, the podcast. And I was, at, um, I was at a conference in London um, and I was just walking around the tables and someone uh, grabbed me and said, are you, are you off the podcast? He didn't quite know. He not met me before in a, in a work context, but he recognised me from the photos and from the from the name. So, mm -hmm. I think yeah, it's surprisingly, it has um, it struck a chord with a few people. I think I think it's probably not everyone's cup of tea, but um, yeah, it's been pleasantly surprised. I think. Yeah, I'd be surprised if uh, I, mean, I suppose we'd never really know if we if we'd lost out on work because of it. They just wouldn't <laughs> ever speak to us. But uh, I'd be surprised if anybody who uh, who would typically go out and search for some, some agile coaching help would be uh, uh, were worried about the, the reputation would be the ones that were holding the purse strings. But um, 
no it, it's i wouldn't say it's it's led to uh, a, 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 an influx of work <laughs> But I don't think it's uh, had a, too much of an impact either way. It has started, like Paul says, a lot of conversations. Um, yeah. And yeah. we get quite a lot of interaction on Twitter now, people asking us you know, questions, topics that we can cover. And, and we've had a few um, live sessions where people have been, we've been streaming and things and people joining in. So a bit like this. Yeah. So, Jeff, you've written some books, you know, in this context. Does it help? That is that a platform for you to help? Because I know you've written uh, three or four books. Four now. Four, right? Mm. So has it helped or not made it much of a difference? Or? I t so it's, it, I suppose it is, it's a good question in a way. I don't have a good answer for you uh, yeah. because I don't really have the data to, to really back it up either way. And I, I'm, I've never really been very good at self-publication, self-publicizing. So Paul mm -hmm. and I, we always feel we, we, you know, we, don't, we don't do sponsorship or anything like that. We, we, don't, we don't try and plug things um, just because we feel guilty and possibly when we listen to things we don't really want to listen to the adverts either so um <laughs> no i don't we don't really uh, you don't really use the use the podcast for that it probably comes up in conversation now and again and, um, yeah but as, as, a, as a passing as a passing thing but no i can hear your thunderstorm starting good lord i wonder what that was yeah. then <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah, serious my, cloud, my clouds have turned into thunder so hopefully the the wi-fi gods keep us together so yeah. we'll see <laughs> you, you, you're, you, you've talk, we've talked a lot about improv on on the podcast as well, Paul. And I wouldn't say that you've necessarily seen seen sales of your book spike uh, after after a session where we've been talking about improv. No, no, definitely not. But it's it's um, and again, we just we never really viewed it, and we made a conscious effort that it wouldn't be a a sales rep a sales sales avenue for either of us. And it's um, it's just. I quite like the fact and we've always just kept it very informal, very unscripted and very um it leave even if we have nothing to really talk about, we'll we'll find something, you know, and it's just been um there's never been a topic really that we've walked into it with. It's just whatever is on our minds at that given moment. We had uh, we had a pub quiz last week. Uh, on we didn't even record this one, so it's it, it's not even gonna go out live. We just we just had a few people into our uh, informal social distance in. Uh, last Friday, and and we ran a we ran a pub quiz uh, with a few agile questions, and and just that started a conversation uh, yeah. there. And, and uh, yeah, it's amazing. We always thought, well, we always thought we 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 did worry. You know, what if we turned up and we we didn't really have anything to talk about, or uh, we started talking about something and it was nothing to do with agile. What would we do? Uh, but that fear has never really materialised. Yeah. Mm. So when you guys, as you walk through or talk through a topic, do you feel like it helps you to kind of bounce it off of like Paul bounce it off of Jeff or vice versa? Yeah. We, and we've often done, so often we'll do this when we're, so like Paul said, sometimes we'll, we, we teach together now and again, we teach some advanced classes together. Um, and so we'll be together somewhere like in, in Dublin, Ireland or in London or somewhere like that. And after work, we'll, we'll, we'll go to the pub and we'll actually just stick the dictaphone on and we'll just have a, have a chat. And so we'll be kind of debriefing the day. Oh. Um, and yeah, we'll be talking through our thoughts and rationalizing them and just seeing where they go. And, you know, how did you see that? And what did you think about that? And what does that mean? And how is that relevant elsewhere? And yeah, it gives you, I think, you know, when we talk to a lot of agile coaches, this idea of if you can if you can explain what you're thinking or, or, or a concept to somebody else, it helps you understand it more. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it's a little bit cathartic in a way. Mm -hmm. Would you say? I wanna... Yeah, definitely. I think, I think it's all, like you said, it's also a, a bit of a retrospective on the day in, in a kind of slightly more fun way. And it's, it's a, a different, it takes some of the effort out of, because we wouldn't want to sit down and do it formally at the end of a, at the end of a training class and sit down and, and have a drains up on, on how it went. But just the, the sense of, a lot of people have said this to us um, just recently because a lot of people in this lockdown situation and they enjoyed, we're, we're doing this regular Friday um, Friday afternoon, Friday evening thing, certainly in the UK. And there were a number of nice tweets that we've had just to say, thanks very much for that. It's just nice to, to share a drink and just to share a bit of chat with people. And it's um, a kind of a nice way just to, actually see an end to the day or see an end to that particular event or whatever it might be that's that's happened 
it is quite quite relaxing. Do you guys find that I, I've talked to a few agile coaches and you know, like some some companies are cutting their hours back. Um, they're looking for options of training or looking for different ways to you know generate income. Do you are you hearing from people like you know? Because I know you guys put some things online, and I know Gareth Gareth put a plug in for you. He said you're the best you, uh, trainers, agile trainers in the UK. So I don't know if you're paying <laughs> Gareth. I'm not sure. But do you find people are reaching out for additional training, or they just kind of want to kind of survive the crisis and and move slowly through it? I haven't seen a huge amount of, of people looking for training right now. I know, yeah. Um, I know there are a lot of people out there that, that are really enjoying and jumping on the the opportunity to run some online training. Mm -hmm. um, and there are people out there that seem to be busier than ever. Um, but no, I think a lot of, you know, even even from a coaching perspective. So I, I, I don't really do a huge amount of training. I, I spend more time either with leadership teams or, or, or coaching coaching teams uh, or coaching individuals. And even that has, has been, just been a case of, right, we need to take stock. Mm. You know, yeah. quite a lot of these people are actually thinking, I need to I need to really think about how this is impacting my business. I need to just, I, I need to focus on something else for a minute. And it's a, it's a quite a normal sort of defensive reaction. Um, it's, it's very sort of short term and, and narrow if you, if you, if you like but it's understandable. And if you think about trying to get people organized to, to a training course right now, it, it must be I, putting myself in their position. I think that would be quite a long way down the list of things to be thinking about. Yeah. But I could think of it the other way in that actually a lot of organizations now think, well, actually this is, this is more of a reason than ever to be agile. Oh. Mm -hmm. And if we're ever going to invest in our people and give them the skills and the tools that they need to actually give this a chance, now is the time. Yeah. And I don't know whether this, this term means anything to you over in the States, furlough. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So in the UK, we're having a lot of that at the moment, people furloughing their workers, sort of eff effectively putting them on, on temporary leave and the government yeah. is subsidizing a lot of their wages um, with the hope that when things get back to normal, the economy can just sort of jump start without mass unemployment. Now, what you can't do on furlough is work, but what you can do on furlough is training. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that that is an option. But I think uh, in general, there's this sort of concerns about sort of cash flow and supply chain and things like mm. that at the moment. So I think I, I think I've seen that. Um, I might be, you know, maybe forecasting too much on this, but I think probably from my perspective, a lot of the the hand waving, that that sense of ah, that panic has a little, just in terms of routine now, has kind of probably subsided a little bit, maybe, and mm -hmm. that kind of that new normal is starting to kick in. That's and a lot, of, a few companies, I think, who have reached out to me just just in the last few days, I think, have started to say, well, let's let's assume now this is the new, this is how we're going to work. Then maybe we do have to start thinking. Okay, how do we do this? How do we pursue our training, or how do we pursue our agile um, journey if we can't be face to face? Because we can't we can't hold on forever. So I think now, particularly in the UK, a lot of people are getting used to um, that the the constraints about around working and around being at home. A lot of people are more comfortable with it, and I think slowly, maybe, we might start to see companies start to. Just try and shift to think, well, how could we, if this is going to carry on for a while, because there's a lot of stories that are saying this could ha happen for months. Yeah. We can't, we can't sit on our, our hands for months. We've got to be able to move this thing forward. And maybe we have to start thinking. Just a cu couple of inquiries that I've had or a couple of emails I've had over the last couple of days have started to give me that sense, maybe. We have a question in the chat about good remote facilitation tools that you used with teams in this kind of pandemic situation. Mm. Well, you, you got, <laughs> Paul I've just spent, me about this. I've just spent the last two days. Um, and again, this is, again, it sounds painful and it sounds like a, um, a chore, but in some respects I'm probably better off because of it, because I've spent the last two days learning how to use Miro. Have you heard of Miro, Tom? Yeah. Yeah. So, 
I was unaware of it until maybe a couple of weeks ago, and it's that that name started to get mentioned to me. But mm -hmm. I don't know. Jeff used it, and Jeff uh, ran a a class with it and had some success with it. So I said, you know what, I'm going to invest my time and my money and actually start thinking about how I can use this tool. And I, I've been, you know, uh, finding my way around it, but generally quite impressed mm -hmm. um, in terms of I think now I can I can certainly run a whole class um, using just one tool, which um, I hadn't experimented with before. I was just using bits of various different tools just to meet um, make meet that demand. But I know I think now um, because I've spent a bit of time on redesigning and, and actually adding some artwork to it, I think I'm actually quite pleased with how it looks and how it how it kind of um, flows. So quite impressed with that. But there's there's, there's quite a few. Um, Google Jamboard I've been using a lot of as well. That's um, Google product. Again, it's all free, but it's really, really easy to get started with just like a virtual, virtual flip chart. Fun Retro is another one I've heard of. Not used it, but a lot of people are telling me that they are using it. Um, a lot of open source stuff that um, Jitsi as well as another um, one that I've been recommended in as a, a um, in opposition to Zoom as a, a, something which is more open source and more integratable. So yeah, there's, there's I've been really really surprised actually. Um, I just saw felt two quite limited. The, just saw two comments in the chat. There is it mural? Oh, it's Miro. The, that seems to be one of the new battles. You know, Android there's two of them, isn't there? Apple. Yeah. Is, is your favorite Miro or is your favorite mural? And I'm sure it's not just those two, but because they have similar sounding names, they're, they're yeah. sort of uh, in, in quite direct competition with one another. And they do look both quite similar, don't they, from what yeah. I've seen? They do. They're both both fabulous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any experience, Jeff? Or? Uh, well, like Paul said, I, I, I jumped into Miro a little bit before him, um, mm -hmm. and it, it, it really, really pleasantly surprised me. Um, it, what was what was great was so uh, the the one class that I ran with it, I had um, some a couple of people on the class who had had more experience with Miro than me, um, and uh, yeah, they were they were helping me uh, awesome. use the tool, um, which 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 is great when you consider it uh, yeah, from an agile perspective. You're looking to bring the class in anyway. You want that sort of self engagement. You want that self management, self organization. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, I often talk to people from a from a coaching perspective. Um, it's not uh, actually you having an opinion can be quite detrimental in a way if you want the team to to, to step up. Um, so if you can genuinely not know, I find it easier to coach in a domain where I don't know. Yeah. Um, then that yeah, we sort of had that. Interesting. So, do you, do you have any favorites? Um, I've used, so I've used mural and Miro, um, just working with another coach. We were trying to, you know, evaluate some things for a company, but, um, the, it was more of a cost things where they were not wanting to pay the price for either one of those. So, but yeah, there's, I, that's the one thing I was wondering about as we kind of go through this, um, situation where there's going to be a lot of, you would know, think a lot of people thinking about, okay, how can we solve this problem? different ways to innovate and solve the solution and, you know, with training and teaching people different things in this. Cause like, if you're talking about there's people and obviously we have this similar situation in the United States to where companies are furloughing workers and people are, um, you know, sitting at home and drinking cider or whatever. So, you know, <laughs> but it's a, it's a, you know, opens a lot of doors for people. Yeah. Yeah. Only if you, not if you're in South Africa though. So you can't, they, they, they banned alcohol, the sale of alcohol when they went locked down. Wow. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, I'll say this. So I live in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has state-owned liquor stores. They shut down a couple weeks ago when the start of the pandemic. <laughs> but the funny thing is, so all the neighboring states, so like, for instance, I live close to New Jersey. So a lot of people are going to New Jersey to get their booze. <laughs> or you can go to so the state of Delaware and uh, the state of West Virginia, which border Pennsylvania. They look, they ask for your ID when you buy your booze, and if yeah. you have a Pennsylvania one, they'll say, "Sorry, we can't <laughs> sell it to you." So it's a similar situation. But my wife has found Wine.com, so we've had a few deliveries from there. So uh, we're we're okay. Good, good, good. good. Mm -hmm. So have you guys used? Just Miro, or have you used Miro as well? I haven't, I haven't used, used Miro, Miro, no. Okay. No, I, 
I, I, again, it was it's one of those things. I think a lot of these things just go on sort of word of mouth and personal recommendations. So, you know, I knew a couple of people whose you know, opinion I really trusted, who had yep. really positive experiences, and also they were willing to give me a bit of a, a free crash course. Uh, yeah, yeah. So a quick dummy's guide to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was that was the sort of clincher for me not that one had necessarily more features than the other or better features than the other it was just sort of access and and, uh, and so on well now vasco says that if they banned alcohol and it would start a revolution in finland so <laughs> <laughs> oh so yeah there's, there's just this um sort of solution type thing you so you're trying to find a solution to things and i think that you know that's a natural human response isn't it when there's a problem is to try and find a solution and that, mm -hmm. i don't want to sound like that's a, that's a bad thing but i don't think there is a solution to this it's it's about coping and it's about um finding a way of of making some progress in the here and now knowing that in two weeks time things are going to be different and the solution might be different because the problem might be different mm. yeah um, and also there are probably i'm not going to say infinite but certainly lots of solutions and you know your solution might be equally good and equally valid or more valid than, than my solution right now but that doesn't mean that we should all do yours mm -hmm. um, and i think that one of the things that i'm seeing from from this globally is it's actually so paul said that we you know we're sort of getting used to this humans are incredibly adaptable incredibly yeah. adaptable uh, as a species we're very resilient and what we are finding is that no matter how alien this sounded to begin with and how scared we all were mm -hmm. i'm not saying it's it's good or it's easy but it's 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 a lot more comfortable now and, and tolerable yeah and, and we do that we adapt um and that's that's what we're seeing and as a, as a species now i think one of the things that we're adapting to is ambiguity mm -hmm. and we'll never we'll never become fully comfortable with ambiguity we're hardwired to avoid it yeah but in, if you look at uh, sort of global press conferences and, and things like that now, governments are feeling more comfortable to say, do you know what? We don't have an answer to that. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the past, it would have been, I have to give an answer. Yeah. And, and it's not causing outcry because people understand that this is mm -hmm. so complex and so dangerous that actually saying, I don't know, but we're going to figure it out yeah. is the right response. So I was talking to my, you know, my, my daughter's um, uh, A level age, so just before university, just before college. Yeah. Uh, so quite an important time in her educational career. And mm -hmm. uh, a couple of weeks ago, the government came out and said, uh, "This year, we're not going to do exams." Yep. So this year, students, you're not going to take exams. And so her response was, "So, so, so, how do how do I get my grades? What what happens?" And they didn't answer that. They just said. We don't know yet. We'll figure mm -hmm. it out. But what we do know right now is that you won't be taking exams. But we don't need to know the answer to the second part before we make no. this decision on the first part. And that's yeah. that's a massive change for a lot of humanity. But it's a really yeah. agile response, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It makes me wonder as to whether organizations, we obviously we can't predict the future, we don't have a crystal ball, but maybe if this huge complexity issue now is staring us in the face um, and we don't have an answer to it maybe companies leadership will be more comfortable with complexity in the future that development teams won't get you know um hung out to dry if they don't know how long it'll take to do something because we don't know that yet there's there's too many unknowns do you think that might happen or am i just maybe too hopeful i think so i, I think also this idea of we'll we'll, we'll become so I'll, I'll put it another way. Quite often, when I'm when I'm working with an organisation, no, I'll say more than quite often. Every time that I'm working with an organisation, <laughs> my part of my feedback to them is, "You're doing too much stuff." Yeah, you've got too many pieces of work, projects in progress. You're too many plates are spinning. People mm -hmm. are spread spread across too many projects and teams. There's just so much stuff going on that you're not really finishing anything. It's it's not it's not revolutionary or it's not particularly insightful, but it's very, very common. And no matter where I go, there are always multiple reasons. If I was being unfair, I'd say excuses uh, as to why they can't stop a lot of this stuff. Yeah, it, uh, the regulator, 
um, the competitor, trade share, we've signed a contract, this customer's going to sue us if we don't, blah, 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 blah. Uh, you know, we've, we've spent too much on it already or, or whatever. There's loads and loads of reasons why they can't stop these things. And what we found now is that they've had to. And yeah. it hasn't been as catastrophic as their excuses mm. were saying yeah. it would be. And so it's been a massive eye-opener for for leaders, for, for project managers, for teams, for organizations in general. Of, do you know what? Are the assumptions that we made about the, the commitments that we made, well, maybe they were slightly faulty. And so maybe we could do less stuff and maybe we will get more stuff done as a result. I think it was on um, on our call last week, Jeff, um, one of our regular uh, listeners, David, um, said he's based in Germany and they've gone down to 80% hours. I think it's 80% hours. So they, have, they can only legally work for 80% of their contracted hours. So he says it's a, it's a massive real-time prioritization problem. You now have to put some things down because you don't have enough hours in the week to do it and you can't work any extra hours than you're contracted. So mm. it's And that is the same for everyone across the board, whether you're you know, the CEO or whether you're just, um, you know, just join the development team, it's, it's for everyone. They've got to do the same thing and they've got to be brutal about how they prioritize their work. Everyone's prioritizing that. Well, that, that's quite key though, isn't it? Because if everyone's doing it, yeah. then I'm less scared about me being the only one in my industry and all the competitors yeah. carrying on when actually they've lost, they've missed the trick there because if all their competitors were carrying on thrashing, on stuff that they would never get finished and they were the only ones to cut down they would have a competitive advantage but ironically when they've lost the competitive advantage they feel safer <laughs> yeah but whatever works. so hal asks in the chat any advice on coaching leadership on the value of self-organizing teams particularly in the current pandemic infested waters um so my my answer to this one is, is I'd be interested in what Paul's got to say about this as well, because um, my view here is that great teams thrive even in these in the hardest situations. So when you're in really difficult situations, the really, really good stand out from the rest. Uh, in my experience, the really, really good teams are the self-organizing teams. So I don't think I would need to do a lot of convincing. My belief is that this will become self-evident because they yeah. will see that. Now, in order for them to see it, they need to be able to compare. They need to have a control sample. So they need to be able to see a self-organizing team and a non-self-organizing team and be able to not just see it, but actually look for it. Because unless they're thinking, oh, I'm going to see how this goes, running a conscious experiment or, or observe consciously they wouldn't necessarily see it um, but having said all that even self-organizing teams need to feel safe mm. and the first thing for any leadership to do in these kinds of situations is to create some form of safety um, because otherwise everyone's going to be struggling um, and even the most autonomous unit will look for a security blanket when they feel adrift. Um, and it's very easy to feel adrift right now. Mm -hmm. And what do you think, Paul? Yeah, I think I was going to mention the safety thing, but you, you covered it. So the only th thing I was mentioned, a couple of people have spoken to me completely outside of the ind uh, my industry and outside of work, but about how they missed their colleagues. So a few of them have been furloughed and a few of them have... Um, you know, maybe lost contact they're not having day-to-day -day contact with people they work with but they they're not so much missing their their relatives because of their family because they're seeing them every day but they miss their work colleagues so that again that spells to me this sense of people get safety from each other mm -hmm. not just from their boss or their leadership but they're from each other so even if teams aren't seeing each other as often they probably feel the need to check in with people more and I think that's never going to be a bad thing, especially in times like this when perhaps people need a bit more connection and they need um, and the, the advantages that we have now with the tools that, that can do this for us. But it's, it doesn't, it does, you don't need to have an excuse now to, to pick up the phone and just to, you know, just to text someone or just to chat with someone just to 
see how they're doing, even if they're not on the team right now. Maybe they've been furloughed or whatever that is, but people that I've spoken to are still checking in with people they work with just to maintain those connections. And I think better teams do that or feel the need to do that, perhaps without thinking. Another question from the chat. Can you cover the psychological side of change being difficult for some and they hold out and become problematic? How do you typically address that? Uh, so what's, what are we addressing here? So the fact that change is problematic. Yeah, the difficulty of change from like a psychological change being difficult. So I think, I mean, I think it's difficult, as you would say in America, period. I think it's difficult for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. And that sense of that, that sense of psychological safety makes any kind of change easier. Um, but the other thing that really for me makes change easier is is the why. Um, so if we if I know why I'm doing something differently, and I can tap that into my personal objectives and my personal values, then that becomes a lot easier. And if I feel supported in doing that, it becomes a lot easier. So I'm looking from from a leadership perspective, and that doesn't have to be a, a, a you know an actual executive of an organisation. Doesn't have to be a line manager. Anyone who I look who, who who looks to me for for leadership, if I can provide some sense of some sense of safety and I can help that person find some sense of purpose and some sense of meaning in the change and then provide them some level of support, then it suddenly becomes a lot easier. I'm not sure if I understood the question correctly. <laughs> Something that can, again, reminds me is we've talked about this, I think last week, Jeff, but um, don't underestimate as well, the safety that people get from being at home. So, because, and I felt this, I went out to the supermarket and it felt like one of the most stressful trips to the supermarket I think I've ever had. But I think it's because I'd spent maybe six days at home and I had one day, I I'd built it all up towards this one day to go out. And then, but so the, the security I felt when I got back in, back home was like a sense of relief that I'm back within my own four walls. So I think there's a, a human side to this that we do tend to feel safer at home anyway. So despite the fact we are all on them, you know, a virtual meetup here, but we are all within our own homes. So you can build on that sense of safety. People might feel more able to speak out or more able to voice their opinion just because they're at home. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, within my own four walls, I think sometimes we forget how much that can be an advantage as well to making something happen. So what, one of the things I like about our, our podcast and just me and Paul working together is that he can disagree with me and, and I can I can challenge him at times. Um, and just on that point about feeling safe in your own home, there, there is that everyone should feel, not everybody does, most people do, yeah. uh, everybody should feel safe in their own home. Um, but actually, for some people, inviting your work colleagues into your home or the part of your home where you're having to work from mm -hmm. is quite intimidating it's quite a sort of vulnerable feeling you know some people their their workspace is their bedroom um some people yep. it's uh, they've got their they've got their kids around um and and they don't they just don't want to show off what's going on in their house right and so this is where some of these tools of you know, virtual backgrounds and, and things like that can can be really equalizing if you like i know um we had we saw the um, the highlights of that uh, the one world together music event mm -hmm. the other day uh, and my teenage daughter she, she, oh, oh i can see inside lady gaga's house that, <laughs> that's that's she knows what she sounds like right? she's heard her sing but she's never yeah. seen inside her house before or see it, elton john's garden and and that's sort of you know that i, I don't really want people to see inside my house oh. you know mm -hmm. so by jeff i think that changes with time though i think the more you do it the, the safer you feel the more you from my perspective, the more I care less about what's in the background, the more people that I've found who've said they accept it, you know, that's really cool. Or that's, I can see your kids playing football in the garden. I was really embarrassed about it to begin with, but you know what people say, that's really nice. You can see your kids outside playing. That's lovely because you are, you're more human. Yeah, You are, you are, um, you may well be on a conference call and people have put Twitter pictures, aren't they? Of like their makeshift office on an ironing board in the bedroom because that's that's the only desk that they had. So there's a, there's an air of you've just got to make do with what you've got. And I think people are much more forgiving, and and that 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 creates a sense of common struggle. I think with between between teams as well is that we're all in this together. 
Yeah. Yeah. Once you've got there, you can look yes. back and think that was a massive part of that bond yeah. being built. But to take that step. It can be quite scary. I agree with that bit. Yeah. 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 So Hazel asks, there's best ways to encourage people to challenge those assumptions without needing a global pandemic. <laughs> um, Good question. Well, it's, it's sort of, um, it's kind of, and I, I, I love Hazel. Um, hi, Hazel. Hazel was one of my Kickstarter backers. Um, <laughs> so I, I, feel I, can, I feel I can be um, a little bit blunt here and say it's kind of a moot point because the box is open now. You can't go back to a pre-pandemic world. Yeah. Um, and so it, everything, you're living in a history GCSE question. You're living in a college economics <laughs> question. Right. We are living through this now. People are going to be referring back to this point in time for over a century now. Mm. Um, and so this is always going to be a massive reference point. And any assumptions that we have going forward are going to be completely different to the assumptions that we had before. So I don't think we need to necessarily answer that. I'd be interested. I don't, you know, we've all got, it can go, the future can go in lots of different ways, obviously. Um, but I don't think we're ever going to have to deal with that that situation where those assumptions haven't been challenged again. Is that fair? Yeah, I, want, I wonder if people, you know, because we'd ask, um, we talk in our, our classes about powerful coaching questions, things like that. Given an ideal world or given a, given a carte blanche, you had carte blanche, an unlimited budget to solve this problem. How we, and some people struggle with that suspended disbelief. But... The fact that you can't, there couldn't be a question that said, imagine a global pandemic, because we, we are, like Jeff says, you are, we are having one. We are um, experiencing that now. So maybe it will help people push themselves that bit further because maybe there are, there are alternatives that you haven't thought of yet. Maybe it might help that creativity a little bit more. So Vasco then, asked this question, what are the mechanisms that are helping people accept uncertainty and the lack of time to do everything they need to do? Well, people have having people accept. I don't. I think time is helpful. The longer it goes on, surely the longer it goes on, it becomes more normal. I think we're, we're proving to ourselves. It, to me, it's a little bit like um, accelerated gradual exposure, if that term makes sense. Uh, so, to overcome a phobia. You, you gradually expose yourself to that phobia, right? So if I'm afraid of spiders, I might have a really, really small spider in a box over the other side of the room. And I know it's there, I can't see it. But over time, maybe I put it in a transparent box and it'll become bigger and I'll get closer to it. And eventually, the stress levels and literally the heart rate goes down and, and, and the temperature and, and what have you goes down. It becomes more normal. And, and every time that you're upping that, you're proving to yourself that you can cope with that. And so what we're doing here is every day that goes by every milestone, whether that's, you know, a, a week or, you know, we've hit the peak or, you know, whatever the, that next milestone is, you prove to yourself, okay, so we've done that. You know, we, we, my wife and I went for a, went for a walk and the, the first three weeks was the big block in, in the UK and so isolation for three weeks. Um, and so our first instinct was, well, we'll never do that. Yeah. We've, we've never had to do that before. We'll fight. Uh, the kids will kill each other. <laughs> Um, and so we went for a walk and we said, do you know what, we, we've done three weeks and yeah, we're still, you know, we're still walking together. We're still talking together. We're still, we're still on good terms. Wow. You know, we, we've done that. Um, so, and we still haven't got any more certainty than we had three weeks ago and our stress levels are lower. And when I say accelerated mm -hmm. gradual exposure is because that's in a very short period of time. But because everything is so concentrated right now, that that pace feels right. This is probably answer to the second, yeah, probably answer the second part of Vasco's question. Um, doing everything that they need to do. I tell you what. On the flip side of what doesn't help is, um, and this is especially something that I've, I know that we've all noticed is, is bad news. So when it's just all over the radio, if the radio for, for us in our house, the radio is on a lot, so we have the radio on. I just kind of need it for background noise, but we have to turn it off because it's just relaying quite frequently how bad everything is. Until I think it was, I think it was my wife or some read something out of the newspaper or read something off off the internet that said, 
Well, there was some good news. It's something like the, the curve started to flatten or we think we're through the worst, or whatever it might be, but start a little bit, just a little bit of good news. But the amount of, of joy that that, you know, the sense of positivity that you get from a little bit of good news can be quite, quite powerful. So when, I know it's quite hard to look for it, but when, it, when we are in a situation where it does seem to be surrounded by global bad news, but just that little glimmer of hope, that little glimmer of positivity can be quite enthusing and can actually um, allow, give people that, that sense, well, maybe we should carry on, maybe we should keep, keep pushing with this, maybe we're going to get through this, maybe we're, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, metaphorically. That's, that's a really good point. And you know, I talked to a lot of Scrum Masters, Product Owners, Change Agents, Leaders, and saying, I, mean, I wasn't using this metaphor then, but you know, what spreads like a virus? Fear, fear spreads like a virus, yeah, but also yeah. optimism spreads like a virus. You know, if you've got a cynic in your team, that can bring yeah. everyone down. But if you've got an optimist in your team, if you've got you know a happy, smiley person, you can all think of one that people just mm -hmm. love being around. And it's really hard to not smile when that person's around. Be that person. You know, not only does it help other people, but it helps you as well. You know, it's hard to feel bad when you're physically smiling. When you, the, <laughs> when you lift the corners of your mouth, it's hard yeah. to feel bad. Something I read about body language as well a while back, but it's very hard to be sad with your arms above your head. Do you realise that? Your arms play a huge part. Because that's why you tend to, when you're cheering about pop concerts, you tend to yeah. cheer with your arms in your air. So it, it, it tends to be, and I tell my, tease my daughter when she's not having a tantrum. I try and hold, I get her to, yeah, try and get her to hold her hands. And she, when she does that, she smiles she, and naturally, because she knows what I'm doing. She, she can't help but smile as her hands go on. Yeah, yeah. right, it works. Interesting. It's very hard I to have an argument with hands. Yeah, it's, it's hard because I don't want to make light of anything. You know, I, 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 I've posted a few things online saying, yeah, it's okay to feel good. It's okay to feel, okay to feel happy. It's okay to feel positive. And I don't want to come across as I'm making light of because there's a lot of, no, a true. Lot of hardship going on out there. There's a lot of people dying, mm -hmm. a lot of people losing their businesses. And th there's a lot of bad stuff going on. And I don't want to gloss over that. But equally, there's a sense of you can choose how to react. And your choice not only affects you, but it affects everybody around you. And, yeah. and it's not as pithy as just making, you know, taking lemons and making lemonade or, or whatever cliche you want. But there is a sense of, okay, well, there's something positive. I can choose which message I want to listen to right now. Now, yeah. Holger asked this question. Do you ever have or have a company that you're working with has using too many tools? Oh, always. <laughs> we could go back to BT for that one, couldn't we? Always. Um, but and, I, and so, I, as well as Paul and I, we argue. I often argue with myself, which can be uh, enter, entertaining for people watching, I suppose, um, but but troubling for my wife and my therapist. Um, but so I, I would say yes, yes. But that, that actually, lots of tools can be a good thing as well, because it's easy to over standardise too quickly. You know, mm -hmm. BT were guilty of that as well. So as well as having too many tools. And it was fragmented and you know, nobody could switch between projects because they had to learn so many new things and so on. Equally, so many times you've been told you have to use this particular tool for standardization purposes. Um, and I think there is there is a nice sweet spot in the middle. And the more complex things are, the more it pays to, to experiment. It, just because I found Miro to be quite useful doesn't mean I should shut myself off from, from all the other options out there. Generally, the better tools that I've seen teams um, use would be they've, two things. They've either been the ones that they've chosen. So involving the team um, in the decision in which tool should we use. Uh, or secondly, tools that they've built themselves. And it sounds a bit trivial, but, but there's a few situations uh, in Nokia where teams just did a bit of free time, had a bit of free time and created something simple enough that they could use it. And it was, it was meeting the purpose and it was free and they'd, they were going to maintain it because they built it. So it's, I know that's, that's probably more particular to certain teams that have that, that, that skill, but there's nothing to say that you have to use something on the shelf if you could create something similar or better yourself. Yeah, you, you, you work with what you what you've got and what you know and where your strengths are. So I'm pretty sure that if um, let's see, I'm, I'm I'm just freestyling here. This could go terribly wrong. 
Um, if, if my <laughs> if my daughter was part of a scrum team with their friends, she'd put her her tool of choice for a retrospective would probably be TikTok. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Now you and I would think TikTok really. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm extrapolating onto you here, Tom. I might be doing you a huge disservice, but um, <laughs> but she's really, really familiar with that and can, can do great things with it. And that would be really creative and she'd be comfortable and, and in a comfort zone. But for us, you know, we've got our comfort zones. And so I think there is a sense of uh, giving the team the freedom, a certain level of freedom, not complete freedom, um, but a certain level of freedom to, be, to find what works for them. Yeah. Yeah, I was recently, I think it's in the Accelerate uh, book. Um, they talk about the teams that do the best pick their own tools and that, you know, when you force a tool on a team, they're obviously not as productive and, you know, they feel like they kind of resist it. But uh, Vasco has a good question here. What do you think will change when we go back to the uh, to work in an office? Mm, Who's to say we will? Mm. Good question. Who's to say we will? Yeah. Uh, I, I think both both sides, both parts of the relationship there are probably seriously reevaluating that. And yeah. companies thinking, yeah, we, we probably could make this work for our people, you know, rather mm -hmm. than these massively expensive, big office and central locations and things where yeah. people are commuting hours and all this stuff. And also people thinking, you know, what? I don't I don't miss my commute. Yeah. Um, and all right. Not everybody has a great optimum setup for working from home but equally it's not really working from home for a lot of people either because for me i've got three kids in the house right so it's not i can't spend eight hours a day like i did before working mm -hmm. um they'd normally be at school or at nursery so when when schools open you've got a completely different normal to what you have now but again it won't be like the old normal and it won't be like the normal in a year's time or three years time. So it's going to yeah. continue the valuation. I think commute, I think travel will be very different. I think, I think people will initially certainly crave going back to work, going back to, I think it's again, in terms of safety, feeling, seeing the people that they've worked with, particularly in stronger teams or, or stronger organizations, people will want to go back to work with their colleagues or peers or friends. But I think a lot of companies will drastically review the necessity to travel. Well, and a lot of my friends who, yeah, well, that's it, a lot of my friends who would regularly be asked um, to travel to London, uh, probably two, three times a week, and then I was saying that's probably largely unnecessary um, or to travel to meet unless you're meet unless you're meeting clients, they're saying travel should be unnecessary. So I think that will I think to get a kind of um, rubber band effect to anything extreme, don't you? Yeah. Okay, so, so we've been we've been missing our team interactions. We've been missing going to the going out for dinner. We've been missing going to the pub or, or go to the cinema or whatever. So there's going to be a. You see all the things that you on social media. When this is over, oh, we're a massive party, yeah, yeah. or we're going to. So there probably will be a sense of well, let's all get back together again because we haven't had the chance before, uh, in some form or other. But I think it will it will slowly sort of settle on something different yes. than before. Um, the new normal, yeah. Yeah, I suppose Vasco's question was what What do we think that new normal will be? Um, and I think it. There will be less centralized office. I think there will be a lot more of the, I don't know what the generic term is that we have. Uh, so we work and the, what do you call, what's the generic term for that, Paul? So the oh, working space or? Workspace, yeah. That, those shared offices that we're. Yeah. Um, oh, work hubs, yeah. Yeah, things like that. That, that. that will definitely, I think, be a lot a lot of a bigger thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think, so I think my people. my brother-in-law said to me this weekend, um, which I'd never, you know, things you don't really stop to think about, but the amount of offices, open plan offices, that are not built to maintain a two meter distance between people. So <laughs> yeah. you, you just, I, I, both or any of the offices that I've worked in recently or, or in previous years, you think back to how that was set up in BT Jeff, mm. we wouldn't be able to work. Le what less of probably less a meter at max between desks between yeah. screens 
It just wouldn't work it, for, for where we are now or maybe where we are in three months, six months, 12 months. You couldn't maintain a sensible I think, a two meter distance between between co-workers. But humans haven't been designed for that, right? We're, we're, uh, we, 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 we actually crave physical contact um, mm -hmm. and, we, and we get pleasure and, and stress release and stress relief from physical contact. So I've seen people saying, you know, on social media, when we go back, I, I can't see people going back to hugging and you know, kissing on cheeks and handshakes and things. But as well as things will change, we do, as human beings, we do generally have quite short memories. <laughs> True. And True. so I think habits and culture and that, that just innate human need and, and desire to be not just emotionally connected to one another and but physically connected to one another to, to to be able to greet and have a hug and have a handshake and a high five and, and and what have you i think that that will trump things when things are safe again yeah, yeah. and that, i think that's part of the drive right i think that's one of the reasons why we want to we want to fix this it's, it's it's not that everyone's saying do you know what yeah we can we can we can stay like this we don't need to interact with one another anymore we do we want to that's one of the reasons why we're, we're working so hard to try and change things and, and find a vaccine and, and fix it so that we can go back to that sense of society community friendship call yeah it what you will yeah and they can have regular pubcasts <laughs> well it's kind of, we kind of feel a bit um, frauds at the moment because we're still calling our pubcast a pubcast but we're not we haven't been in a pub for months, Jeff. Well, it feels like it feels like months. Well, so I'm for what it's worth. You can't see this. You can see the wood behind me. I'm in a. I'm in a. I'm my out my office, which is in my garden. Uh, so it's, it's effectively what used to be a shed. Uh, and here, I'll, I'll knock on that. That's my that's my homebrew barrel. So I think <laughs> of this is a pub as, as the Jeff Arms. Yeah, <laughs> Jeff's Arms. See, I can just, so can just do some optics. Jeff, put some optics behind you. That would be yeah. perfect. Okay, top up. So uh, yeah, so I believe I'm in the pub, and I've got my I've got my agile podcast beer mat. There you go. Resting my beer on. So yeah, this is coming live from the Jeff Arms. Excellent. Well, hey guys, it's been about an hour. I appreciate all your time. Just want to thank you, um, and really appreciate you guys joining us and sharing all of this and answering questions and and sharing your brews with us. That's lovely. Yeah, thanks, oh, thanks for having us. Excellent. All right, guys. Well, this is going to wrap it up. We'll talk to you soon. We'll let you know what we're working on uh, planning the next Agile Online Meetup for next month. So we'll talk to you later. Cheers, guys. Thanks so much. Cheers. Cheers. Ta-da.